we're going to get going and then just allow other folks to join as we move forward. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we we're happy to talk about Streamside Lanoa Workshop. And I am your host, Sarah Rosero. I am a community engagement coordinator at Snohomish Conservation District. And I've worn a few hats, but really happy to have landed in this position. Our co-host tonight is Ariana Winkler. She is our WCC uh, Restoration Project Assistant, and she was on our crew last year as well. So tonight we're gonna to be talking all things streamside, whether it's beavers or invasive plants, and really wanna hear what some of your concerns are tonight. And we just wanna take a moment to appreciate our funders and everything else to make this possible for everyone. So how you'll be interacting with us tonight, um, all your audio lines are muted and only our panelists will be able to share and speak video and we'll have a poll as well that will be anonymous. So if you have any questions, please throughout the webinar, tap them into the, type them into the Q&A tab. And then if you have any technical questions or just comments, go ahead and use the chat function for that. So if you have not worked with us before or don't know what a conservation district is, um, we work with all types of people, different partners and landowners. Um, with all of our work going towards conserving natural resources. We're, we work with people on a voluntary, non-regulatory basis, and we have multiple funding sources to keep us going. Um, some of our teams that we have today, we have Kristen and Lisa from our Habitats and Floodplain Management team. We also have a community conservation team that's all things stormwater and urban agriculture, and then we have a sustainable agriculture, um, working with farmers and other folks out in rural areas or urban areas even. We have engineers, and then we also um, have an outreach team in which we're on, getting all these events going, and just so many different things to provide um, our community, whether you're in Snohomish County or Camino Island. So some of our upcoming events, we had a rain barrel sale today in Lake Stevens. Um, this is unfortunately our last webinar for the year, but starting in January, we'll be doing a few presentations for the Country Living Expo. And then we're gonna be having our plant sale at the end of February with pre-orders opening in January. So keep an eye out for that if you're interested in some native plants. And Elisa manages our plant sale, and she's got some great new plants this year. So we're really excited to be able to keep offering native plants and getting those out into the community. We are so lucky to have the brilliant and wonderful Kristen Marshall. She is the program manager for the Habitat Restoration and Floodplain team, um, and she'll be speaking throughout the webinar to offer her expertise and to share some information with you all. And then we also have the glorious and, gosh, Elisa's so great. Um, she's our Habitat Project Coordinator. So she, live, she manages our Living with Beavers program and the plant cell, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us all. So just wanna say thank you ahead of time. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Elisa. Thanks, Sarah. I'm just going to start sharing my screen here and get our presentation going. All right, so tonight we're talking about streetside landowners. Um, Kristen and I are going to kind of work together on this talk um, throughout different topics. So I'll start us off. Kristen will jump in in the middle and we'll kind of trade off back and forth. Um, so you get to hear both our voices tonight. And um, so our focus really today is what is a healthy stream side? What can we do on our stream sides that we live on? Um, and what are some of the impacts that these stream sides experience uh, due to human land use? Um, so I wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that we occupy the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in this region since time immemorial. In particular, we would like to recognize the Tulalip, Stiligwamish, Snohomish, and Sauk Suwadal tribes for their continued care and protection of this land and these waterways. We are committed to listening to, learning from, and working in partnership with these sovereign nations. 
We also want to offer a quick acknowledgement and thank you to our funders. This talk in particular um, is funded you know, jointly by Department of Ecology and the Recreation and Conservation Office. We also want to acknowledge all of you as landowners in our service area. Um, Ratepayers fund a lot of our work. Um, and so really you tonight are here as one of our funders. So we really appreciate that. And we want to start off here with a little poll. So Sarah is going to send out a poll to everyone. Um, please answer our questions here. This is going to help us guide our talk. We want to know, number one, do you live on a stream in Snohomish County or Camino Islands? Are you within our service area really living on these streams? And what concerns do you have about your stream side? Um, you're able to pick more than one, I believe. Um, so check any that really are things that concern you about stream side habitat and we can really target those as we talk. We're gonna cover all of these, so don't worry if every single one is a worry for you or a concern. Um, we'll talk about all of them, but we just wanna get a good guidance on what you're looking for. And um, so we'll leave this up for just a couple seconds. Please share your answers. As Sarah mentioned earlier, this is an anonymous poll. Perfect, great. Okay, so we've got a few folks here that are streamside landowners in our area. Um, and it looks like a lot of our concerns are invasive plants is a big one. Um, so we'll certainly focus on that. We've got a lot of concerns about fish habitat and stream movement um, and a little bit of concerns about beaver activity and erosion <clears throat> and some other concerns. So please feel free to type in the Q&A or in the chat box what some of those other concerns might be. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of those questions throughout our talk tonight. We're going to take some pauses throughout to answer questions as well. So um, Sarah and Ariana might jump back in and ask us some of those questions as we take those pauses. So feel free to keep typing them in as we go along and we'll make sure to take those breaks. So tonight we really want to focus on the Stillaguamish watershed. Um, you know, in Snohomish County, we have multiple watersheds, um, but the Stillaguamish is a really important one. Um, there's a rich history on the Stillaguamish of folks living here and um, making their livelihoods here. Uh, we have a lot of history of forestry, uh, agricultural usage, recreational usage, and just folks living along uh, in this watershed. So we're going to focus on the Stille tonight for some of our examples, um, and a lot of our assistance can happen in the Stille, but also in other streamside watersheds. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about the Stillaguamish tonight. Um, so generally, really along streamsides, what we see historically in the Stillaguamish watershed and throughout our region is a lot of streamside forests. We have trees growing along the streamsides, um, and this is the way that our ecosystems have developed. And so these streamsides have these streamside forests have a lot of different functions that we're going to go through tonight. A big one is shade. Uh, our streams are typically cool, and that shade provided by vegetation helps keep them cool. Um, the vegetation also slows and filters runoff as it rains. That water seeps into the ground, gets soaked up by roots, and then some of it trickles into the stream. These streamside forests also add complexity. As trees fall, as leaves fall, um, we're, we gain some complexity in this habitat, some different features. It's not just a shoot. You know, it's got some meanders, it's got some logs in it, maybe some beaver dams. Um, and the roots from these streamside forests also help to prevent erosion. Um, so they are holding on to some of that soil, which is really, really great. Um, and finally, the, one of the big impacts of our streamside forests is that they provide a lot of habitat for all kinds of different fish and wildlife, particularly for salmon, which is our really big, uh, you know, resource concern around this area is our salmonids. So these are our five Pacific salmon and they spend a lot of their time, their life out in the ocean and then return to freshwater to spawn. So these are kind of our five big players that we're always thinking about in these streams. Um, and really the most important thing to remember with salmon and, and the easiest way to remember what salmon need is they need clean, clear, and cold water. So if you think about all these streamside forest functions, those streamside forests are really helping con to contribute to maintaining clean, clear, and cold water. So a quick deep dive into some of our species. Um, this is really kind of the close up of all of our adult salmon. These are the returning spawners where their body changes when they're out in the ocean. They're just these sleek silver fish and then they come back and get these hooked jaws, humped backs, big teeth, 
Um, and they're really gorgeous in their own special way. So we've got Chum, Pink, Coho, and Sockeye. Um, Coho are a species of concern. So that means that their populations have been depressed enough that you know scientists and regulators are keeping an eye on their populations if we have concern about the levels that they're at. And then we've got our big fish. Our Chinook are the big ones, the king salmon. Um, and Chinook are threatened. So I wanted to highlight them separate from the other four salmon that we have because they, their populations have reached such a low level that we are really, really concerned. They're threatened. They're listed as uh, a threatened species. We also have some other trout species. And, um, you know, similar to salmon, they need clean, clear, and cold water. So they have a lot of similar needs as our fish that go out to the ocean and return. Um, so these are our four cutthroat, bull trout, steelhead, and rainbow trout. Um, and two of these are threatened as well, similar to the Chinook. So once again, thinking about that need for clean, clear, and cold water, um, these fish need that as well. So highlighting the Stillaguamish watershed salmon populations, um, this graph shows the salmon populations since the 90s up to the 2015 timeline. Um, and really what I want to highlight here is that, you know, on the Stillaguamish, it's kind of our poster child watershed that we're talking about tonight. And the populations of Chinook salmon are really, really low. Um, so these dotted lines represent our recovery goal of what we want to see in terms of fish population, um, returning fish to the Stillaguamish watershed. Um, and so our recovery goal is up to 18,000. And right now, uh, you know, for the last 30 years, we're really hovering around that 1,000 fish. And um, so that's a, a pretty uh, sad number to think about. Um, so we, I wanna dive into why. You know, why are these populations so depressed and what can we do to reverse that? We obviously have this recovery goal. What are some of these impacts that might be uh, contributing to that loss of fish population? Um, so really, in terms of impacts, we're talking about people impacts, which is why I put this little smiley guy here. Um, we're talking about, you know, white settlers that moved in and changed this landscape um, and the ways that it has been used, how the land has been used since that time um, that contribute to this fish loss. So in the Stillaguamish, one of the really big concerns is peak flows. Um, so this is really thinking about those wintertime flow events, right? When we get a lot of water. Um, in the Stillaguamish, that water is often, we, it's a, a mixed rain and snow system. So sometimes in the winter we get snow, it'll melt and we'll get those spring runoffs. But with climate change, what we're seeing is more and more water falling as rain in the winter and getting these bigger peak events. And so, you know, something to highlight here on this graph with this, this uh, you know, peak flow uh, throughout the years is that five, the five largest floods that have ever happened in the Stillaguamish watershed were within the last 15 years. So we're seeing this trend of peak flows being really high. A piece of this is kind of the shifting land use and the other piece of it is the climate change. So thinking about natural hyd hydrology, um, you know, in a natural system, we've got trees, we've got vegetation along a stream side, water is falling, some of it's getting taken up by plants, some of it is infiltrating into the groundwater, a small portion of it is heading into our streams. Um, and so this is kind of our natural system. This is the way water is moving through. We all learned about the water cycle in elementary school, I'm sure. But what we see and what changes with human land use is that we don't get as much infiltration, we don't get as much uptake from plants, and so we get a lot more water running into our streams, um, which can contribute to high peak flows. Um, so you'll notice in this, this graphic, now we're getting 55 to 70 percent heading into our streams, making these really flashy systems where we get big pulses of water when we have a rain event. Another look at this impact um, is reduced channel complexity and loss of the vegetation. You can imagine as folks move in and want to farm land or live on that land or just see their stream, the first thing they do is chop down that streamside forest that we talked about. And this is something that, you know, perpetuates. It's harder to grow the trees there once we've just established this whole new ecosystem. So some of the impacts of losing that loss of vegetation is less refuge for wildlife and fish, right? We're losing that complexity. We don't have those logs falling in the streams. We don't have places for young fish to hide. Um, and we don't have refuge for other wildlife in the form of that vegetation around the stream. 
This also leads to increased temperatures, more exposure to sun for the stream and the waterway, increased pollution since our plants aren't able to uptake any of those nutrients or other pollutants heading into our stream, and a reduction in storage of water. Um, so this just means that water can move much more quickly through these systems uh, when we don't have roots helping to uptake that. We don't have really good, easy, um, accessible floodplains for our rivers to utilize and spread out. So all of these impacts coming from the loss of vegetation. Especially I want to highlight that water temperature impact. Um, temperature, as I mentioned, is a really important factor for fish. Our salmon really need that cold water in addition to it being clean and clear. So this is an image of our Stiligwamish watershed. Um, red and orange represent temperatures that are too high for fish. So that's a, a threshold where now our salmon are not able to survive or are feeling sick from that hot water. Um, so you'll notice in 2011, our average temperature was pretty high in the lower Stiligwamish, but okay as we head up into the upper watersheds. Um, and with climate change projections, what we're seeing is that by 2040, that temperature, that, that lethal temperature for fish, that uninhabitable an uninhabitable temperature for fish is going to spread further along our watershed. So we're getting less areas where fish can feel comfortable, where fish can live well. Um, and so water temperature impacts are really huge. So thinking again about our fish and all of their uh, processes, um, I wanted to highlight kind of the salmon life cycle. Um, so these fish are coming back as adults to the freshwater streams where they lay their eggs, those eggs develop, the juvenile fish spend time in freshwater streams, head back out to the ocean, spend a lot of time out there getting big and fat, and then returning to a freshwater streams. So thinking about the salmon life cycle and the impacts that all of these uh, streamside forest loss can lead to, um, really this high temperature is something that impacts our young salmon the most. Those eggs are needing those cold temperatures to develop well. Um, the, the young fish need those cold temperatures to survive in these streams. Um, you know, fish spend variable amounts of time as juveniles in the freshwater, but some spend up to a year or more in our freshwater system. So they really need that cold water there. Um, but this also has an impact on our adult fish returning. The adult fish don't want to come from the cold ocean into our hot river. So making sure that these temperatures are cold enough for those returning fish to feel comfortable to move in. Another impact that we see a lot in the Stiligwamish watershed and throughout Snohomish County and beyond is fish passage barriers. And this is a really hot topic that I'm sure folks have seen. Um, and fish passage barriers come in a lot of different forms. Typically what we're talking about is roadway culverts. Um, right, so these culverts under roads where we're putting a stream from a natural channel into a pipe of a small size. And this can lead to a lot of different ways that, um, you know, fish can't get through. It can be that the water is moving too fast because the pipe is very small and too much water is trying to move through it. It can be that there's not enough room for the fish to jump, right? We know our salmon are great jumpers, but they need a pool in order to get that speed up to jump. Um, it can be that the culvert doesn't have enough water or it's too high or it's an okay height for our really big fish but not our young juvenile fish. So we're seeing a lot of these fish passage barriers being corrected and there's a lot of funding out there for correcting fish passage barriers. So this is an example um, near Darrington of a fish passage barrier that was corrected by the Washington State Department of Transportation. So this is the, what the culvert looked like before uh, it was changed. And then it was updated into a big bridge. And so that way we're really getting a more natural stream process. Our fish can move through there without any issue. It's not an exhausting leap for them to try and get up there. Um, and they can really move through the system further and further. So thinking about these fish passage barriers and our salmon life cycle and where that might impact fish, it's gonna impact our adult salmon spawning coming up to return. Um, but it also can impact our juveniles that are trying to move in this system, right? They're trying to head downstream to get back out to the ocean. But like I mentioned, some of them are spending a lot of time in the freshwater, trying to eat some small bugs, live their lives in the freshwater streams. And so it can impact those juveniles as well and their ability to move up and down a stream system. Okay, so I'm gonna take a quick pause. I've talked a lot about fish <laughs> uh, and temperature 
um, and some of these early impacts. So I'd love to pause and see if there are any questions that we can answer right away. Um, and then coming up next is we're gonna talk about some more stream impacts. Perfect, yeah, we just had a comment, um, which I think something we'll move through, but someone wants to just make sure they're doing everything possible to keep the stream that's running through their property healthy. And um, we'll definitely be addressing that later on in the webinar. Um, but Ariana, do you have any questions from Facebook? Yeah, there are two questions on Facebook. Um, one is regarding the district stance on knotweed and um, if we would like to control it and our feelings on the use of pesticides. Yeah, we're going to talk about invasive plants later on, so I'm going to table that question until we get to it, and I'll make sure I address that, because I do have a slide about knotweed, so don't worry. Great, okay, me. yeah, and Thank then you. the other question was about um, planting fish, and if we work with um, WDFW in these watersheds. Oh, great question. Yeah, we do partner with WDFW. Kristen, do you want to jump in, too? Go ahead, Elisa. Um, we do partner with WDFW, the conservation district ourselves. We don't do any fish transplanting or working at hatcheries, but we do certainly work with organizations that do that. Thanks. Anything to add, Kristen? No, that's great. Um, if you wanted more information about uh, those hatchery or fish planting programs, a lot of those have gone away, uh, but we can certainly put you in touch with someone at either Fish and Wildlife or tribes are also very, very involved in um, hatchery work and so we could put you in touch with your the tribe that's working in your local watershed. Perfect. And then I just have one more question that rolled in. Um, in terms of salmon life cycle and everything else, are there any other impacts on eggs that we need to be concerned about or can address? Yeah, certainly. The eggs are really heavily impacted by temperature, as I mentioned, and they're also impacted by those peak flows. If we think about those really fast flows, high flows moving through the system, it can disturb the eggs and the gravel that they're buried in. Um, and also sediment, which we're going to talk about very shortly. So that can kind of bury fish eggs and reduce their oxygen level. Perfect. Thank you so much. And that's all we'll do for now. Perfect. Okay, Kristen, you're up. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for that question about um, sediment and you, it's almost like you had a preview of our presentation because um, that's what I'll be talking about uh, for a couple slides now is uh, geomorphology and erosion. So basically the process by which streams and rivers move. And that's really um, the streams and rivers, the fact that they move is probably one of the most challenging issues that we as, as property owners living along streams and rivers um, experience is that they're dynamic, they move. Um, and that's just, that's part of their natural process. And it's really important for fish and wildlife and our overall watershed health. But it, it also poses some substantial challenges. Um, landslides along rivers contribute sediment, but it can, um, and a little bit of sediment is, is fine and kind of natural um, sediment moving through the system. You may have localized eggs getting smothered, but as long as your whole system isn't overloaded with sediment, then um, those fish populations can kind of rebound from that. You have, you know, a slide. This is this photo is an example from Trangin Meander, um, which is a well-known slide on the South Fork still of Wamish near kind of in between um, Arlington and Granite Falls. Um, but that erosion again in landslides can pose a problem for property owners. Um, Agricultural producers can lose income when their, their land erodes, and then um, homeowners also, just the, they can lose their, um, their trees, they can lose their yard, or they can even lose their home. Next slide, please, Elisa. So this is an example on the North Fork Stillaguamish River of kind of how natural channel migration um, can occur. Uh, so this is for those people who are familiar with the Arlington Highway 530 corridor. Um, this is the old Far Pastures Nursery and it's been a few other things. This is a 1933 photo of what the North Fork Stillaguamish looked like. Um, and you can see um, just south of it is the Trafton Trailhead County Park. And um, along the, you can actually see Highway 530 going across um, just on the kind of 
south, I guess, western boundary of the property. Um, and the next slide shows what the property looked like in, um, gosh, I think this was the 90s. Yeah, 19, this is a 1990 photo. Um, and you can see that actually along the river, um, there are some levees that have been that were built by the property owner to stop the channel migration. But you can see over time, um, that river moved quite a bit. Next slide, please. And so that river movement, as I said, can pose real challenges um, for property owners. This is another example of naturally occurring channel migration and landslides and soil erosion that you can see on a river. This photo is an example from the Pilchuck River um, in the Lake Stevens area, if you're familiar with Lake Connor Park area. And you can see um, on the left bank, so on the left, um, sorry, right bank, the right side of the photo, you can see um, a landslide occurring and um, trees falling into the river. That's um, an actual really important piece of river processes is that wood, those trees falling into the river and creating habitat. Elisa is going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, but channel migration can change really quickly and you can see in this photo that there's a, um, a log jam that built up and actually pushed the channel into um, a different area. And, and you can see that on the next slide. I pulled um, aerial photos. The one on the left is a photo from I think 2012 and it shows that um, the river, the Pilchuck River, is really up against that bank and um, causing that, that slope to slide. You can also see some homes. Um, those homeowners have been very concerned about the slides that are happening on that river. And then in about 20, 14, 2015, that log jam that you saw in the earlier photo built up and the channel actually evolved or eroded through that bend. It kind of straightened itself out um, probably during a flood that all that log jam built up and it pushed the river in a different direction. And so now that old landslide, um, it's still sliding, uh, but it's not having the, the river erode it. And it's actually going to start building up. It's starting to grow willows and other trees. And they the river is now in a different direction um, or a different part of the channel. And that's very natural that rivers just kind of bounce back and forth across their floodplain. Next slide. Um, this doesn't always work well for humans, right? Um, so we buy a property and we build a house and, um, and we kind of get used to or, or need in some cases that house to stay or the, the river to stay where it is. Um, there have been a lot of local examples and, and really all across western Washington we've seen headlines of people losing their home, losing their property, um, acres and acres of agriculture land washing away in a year. In a lot of cases there are not, there isn't really anything we can do um, to stop that process from happening. We can slow it down, we can manage our land better. Um, one of the one of the attendees had mentioned that they're really interested in learning how to manage their land um, in a healthy way for the stream and river and, and in a positive way for us. Elise is going to talk about that. Um, but in a lot of cases in those slides, this is a photo actually from Trange and Meander, um, you know, we can, we can do things to manage our property well and reduce our risk, but we can't really stop big giant landslides from happening. Uh, next slide. And this is an example on the Pilchuck River um, from 2019. Actually, this um, this house it's an uh, it was an uh, a vacant um, vacation home, and unfortunately, in 2019, it did slide into the river. Um, it's important to know, though, that if you are in this situation, um, you don't just have to watch your house fall into the river. There are examples in. Um, of, of people who have been able to relocate their home. And Snohomish County and the federal government through FEMA do offer assistance programs for property owners who find themselves in this situation. Um, so one of the services that the Conservation District can offer is to connect you with those resources if you are experiencing slides or erosion on your property. Um, next slide, please. It's, it's kind of helpful though, um, as you're looking at your property and what you can do to manage it, it's, it's helpful to understand the process, uh, how this migration or how these um, systems are moving. So this is an example, um, and you can probably click through one more slide, um, of, of how these channels migrate. And so you can see on the top that we have a very bendy or meandering stream. 
Um, we have a point bar or a gravel bar that builds up on the inside of a bend. That's kind of the low energy area where sediment is going to build up. And then on the outside bend is where the energy of the, the water is focused. And that's called a cut bank. And that's where um, over time it's going to erode. And then the point bar builds up. And then as you look at the middle and then down to the bottom, you can kind of see how over time that stream can change. Next slide. Um, and what I didn't mention, sorry, on the last slide, but don't go back, um, is that those, those features, that channel migration, does create habitat for fish and wildlife. So you saw that there were riffles where um, fish spawn and there are pools where they hide. This is another example of um, a stream profile that shows these different habitat features. So you've got the cut bank where the high energy is. Um, that's also often the deepest part where a pool is. And that's where, um, as Elisa said, those juvenile fish will go in the summer and hang out in the pool because that's where the water is and it's often colder. And then during flood stage, um, as our rivers come up in the winter, you can see where um, they flood out over the, the point bar. And that's typically a lower energy area. Next slide, please. Um, so a photo of kind of what that looks like on, on the landscape is, um, is here, where you can see on that high bank, you have a cut bank. And then on the opposite side, you've got a point bar that's starting to revegetate with willow and other species that come in early. Next slide. Uh, this is a local example from Woods Creek of kind of what that can look like. Um, go ahead. You can see the stream going through here. Um, and you can see those places uh, on the outside bank where the energy is, that's where those red lines are, that's where erosion can occur. Um, go ahead. And you can see point bars are building on, or gravel bars are building on that other side. Um, go ahead, one more. And so that's how the channel is gonna move, is it's gonna move kind of down and out on those outside bends. Um, next slide. Now, it can, this is a photo of that exact bend. Um, so you, the, the photo that we were looking at, the, gray, the black and white, was from 1990. And um, this is a 2018 photo. So, you know, you can see that things can actually stay the same for a long time. And it can give us a false sense of security. Um, and Elisa is going to talk a little bit about how... Um, how we could, you know, if you were the property owner here, what could you do to minimize the risk of, say, that channel um, eroding really, really fast or avulsing or cutting through um, one of these bends? Um, but we can't count on it to stay, and we can't count on it, on it to stay in one place forever. If you go to the next slide, um, you, this is a little bit upstream um, on Woods Creek. And you can see I've traced the blue line through where the stream is. And you can see there's a lot of bends um, on, on this section of the stream. And this is actually called um, tortured meanders is what this, these kind of intense bends look like. And, you know, it's been kind of stable for a while. And then in, oh, I don't know, about 2015, 2016, the landowners um, started to see a lot of erosion happening in, during high water events. The water, um, the stream just didn't want to make these turns anymore. And so it started cutting across the landscape. Um, and you can go to the next slide and see um, when I was out there in 2018 and 2019 what's going on. The photo on the left shows um, where this, in this property owner has actually lost quite a bit of land and their fence has fallen into the stream and they've had to put up um, a temporary fence and keep having to move that fence back and they're losing pasture uh, for their animals. And you can see that there's, you know, there's sediment contributing to, um, to the stream in these areas. Again, some sediment, the system, you know, needs that sediment because it, it creates gravel bars and riffles for, for fish to spawn. Um, but this is kind of excessive. And one thing that you can notice in the background of that second photo on the right is that this landowner actually did try to plant trees. Um, but even when we, we plant trees, they do fall in. Thanks, Elisa. Um, they can fall in in the, in the case where we've got just a big, big erosive force. Um, and in this case, they, they had planted a pretty narrow strip of trees. So Elisa will be talking about um, strategies to try to minimize that risk if you do live on a stream bank and you're worried about erosion. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. 
One uh, place where people sometimes like to try to, uh, well, we do try to lock the river in and, and prevent erosion. And one popular option um, all the way through about the late 90s, early 2000s was bank armoring or riprap, so putting rock along the river. Um, and that can help. Um, it also, though, provide, um, creates a lot of problems. So there's a loss of refuge habitat. Um, it disconnects the, the river from side channels and places where fish need to go to hide. Um, it increases speeds because it locks that, it basically creates a, a water slide effect where the stream um, is locked into place and all that water is directed um, downstream and it's high energy. And it decreases the ability of that floodplain area next to the river to store water. And so it, it overall, the system um, becomes flashier, higher flood events. Um, and the big thing is that riprap um, and other really hard bank armoring um, transfers the risk. So it might help this property owner, but downstream, the next person um, may be at greater risk because there is the higher speeds and there is more water um, because it's not able to flood the, the, uh, the side channels and it's not able to reconnect with, spill out onto the floodplain. So um, it's really about risk. Thanks, Elisa. Um, this is an example of someone um, who experienced a pretty um, excessive channel migration on their property. This is again the Pelchuk River. Uh, where in, gosh, I think this photo is from 1999 is the black and white. And you can see that um, the channel's meandering. And they actually had riprap along that narrow tree line, um, Elisa, on the, um, yeah, down, downstream on the Lund property. Um, yeah, they had riprap all along there. But the channel actually, because they didn't, you can't riprap the entire river. Um, and so it actually eroded in a vulse, the river cut behind the riprap. And that's what you're seeing in the 2018 photo where it's actually completely gone behind the riprap. And if you go to the next slide, we can see some drone footage of what that looks like now, um, that property. And it's now completely cut in, you know, it's reconnected this, um, this little stream and, and wetland area um, and re reactivated that little side channel. Um, which has actually created some great habitat, but you can see that this farmer has also lost quite a bit of land. I, I don't know, I think it was on that uh, five or six acres of land in about 10 years that they lost. So while bank armoring um, has been used in the past, we've kind of shifted to more um, natural approaches that work with stream processes. And, and we really do need to understand that anything that we do on, anything that one person does on their property does impact the people downstream. And we can't, um, regulatory agencies who, who permit these projects can't necessarily transfer the risk from one person to another because it's just, it's just not fair. Um, so there are a lot of challenges um, with all of these, um, all of these processes and what Elisa will talk about later is what can you do as a property owner to again reduce your risk um, and also help the stream and stream or river um, exist more naturally and allow some of these processes to occur. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, another impact, uh, nutrients. And um, so, you know, in general, nutrients are good, right? We, our plants need nutrients to survive. Uh, but the issue really comes when we have too much of nutrients. So we're talking about nitrogen and phosphorus in general. Um, they're kind of the big players in all of this. And so when we get too much nutrients into our stream systems, um, that really leads to a lot of algae growth. Um, and the algae kind of takes over and we see a reduction in oxygen as that algae continues to grow, uses up a lot of that oxygen, and then we have less oxygen available in our waterways for fish and other wildlife. Um, so, you know, nutrient pollution is one thing that can have a really big impact on streams. Um, you know, some, for some sources are fertilizers, septic systems, grass clippings, animal waste, all these things can contribute. Um, so keeping those things away from our waterways is really, really important. Um, and the main message here is that nutrients 
can be a pollutant, but when we have the right amount of nutrients, it really contributes to our whole ecosystem and our big food web on these streams. Um, so thinking about our forested stream side, we've got all kinds of bugs that live in and out of the water. Um, a lot of the stream bugs that we experience, uh, they spend a juvenile phase in fresh water and then will grow into a flying insect such as our dragonflies or mayflies. Um, but other, you know, stream bugs are ones that spend their whole life in that fresh water. Um, and a lot of the, the really interesting thing about these invertebrates living in streams is that they can be indicators of water quality. Um, you know, insects like mayflies can't tolerate really poor water quality. And so to have a really healthy ecosystem, we need to have that right balance of nutrients um, and clean water. Um, so then, you know, we've got these bugs, but then we also have all these fish. So we've talked a lot about salmon already, but we have other fish that live in our streams. Um, things like sculpins and lampreys, these fish are also living in our fresh water. It's not only about trout, but of course, our salmon are really important and our trout are really important. So thinking again about those juvenile fish that spend a lot of life, their life cycle here in the stream, but also some of those resident trouts, um, like we talked about earlier, you know, our steelhead and our um, bull trout are threatened as, in addition to our Chinook salmon. So those fish are living in our streams, but we also kind of expand our food web around adjacent to the stream. We get amphibians, lots of salamanders. I do a lot of work with uh, around beaver ponds and I am always impressed when I see salamanders and um, frogs out there. So lots of amphibians living in these ecosystems. We also get birds, things like woodpeckers that utilize the trees, things like geese that maybe pass through on a migratory pattern. Um, and big birds like eagles that love our salmon uh, almost as much as we do. Um, and we also get bigger mammals. So, you know, I've been lucky enough to see river otters out on streams and the deer really utilize these streamside forests and, and the streams themselves um, and lots of other mammals. Um, and then of course, we also get beavers along stream sides. So um, I just want to touch a little bit, you know, beavers are an important part of our streamside ecosystem in addition to all of this other fish and wildlife that we have here. Um, and so I wanna to touch a little bit on beavers because it can be a big concern for our landowners, um, but certainly we can do a much bigger deep dive into beavers. Um, I do manage our Living with Beavers program, so any questions can come to me um, or certainly check out one of our Living with Beavers webinars as well. Um, so beavers can be a little bit scary because of their impacts to vegetation and the way that they change streams. So certainly Kristen talked a lot about the way streams kind of change themselves just based on that movement of water um, and beavers can kind of have a, a, a similar impact in that they are taking our stream from its, you know, its channel that we're used to and maybe expanding that into a bigger pond. So really that, that can impact, you know, adjacent land use, um, but it also is very important for these ecosystems. These um, wetlands cause, slow the water down, provide a lot of really great habitat for fish uh, and other wildlife, uh, including our salmon who really need, those juveniles need these deep, cool pools that they can rest, find food, uh, hide from predators. So really adding to the complexity of the ecosystem. Um, so these are just a couple images of different dams that we've encountered uh, throughout our region. Um, and just really thinking about you know, what, what impact do these beavers have uh, on this ecosystem? Typically very positive, but potentially negative for our human infrastructure. Um, so some of the conflicts that we see that I, I deal with in our Living with Beavers program, tree chew is a big one, uh, you know, lots of vegetation, culvert blockage, beavers see culverts as just this little hole in a dam and they're really drawn to block those up, which can in turn cause increased fish passage concerns, right? If we've got our whole culvert blocked up, how are fish gonna get through there? Especially if it's already a tough spot for them to get through. Um, and then general flooding is another big concern with beavers because they are, part of their goal is building these dams to create a bigger ponded area. And so if we've got agricultural land or homes or roadways near these streams, when that water comes up, um, it can be tough. Um, luckily, there are solutions for all of these concerns regarding beavers. Just really quickly want to throw these up here. Certainly, if you have more questions, we can chat. Um, 
Tree chew can be resolved with tree wrapping. Uh, really easy to keep beavers away from trees by wrapping them with fencing. Uh, culverts, we often try just to keep beavers away from culverts. It's really not a great spot for them to build for us or for them or for the rest of the wildlife. So if we can just exclude them from that area and let them build somewhere else, uh, that's really great. And then for general flooding, we utilize devices called pond levelers, which help us to manage water levels um, such that beavers still have some habitat, creating a new ecosystem, but our infrastructure is no longer impacted. And all of this is stuff that SCD can help with. So certainly give me a call if you're experiencing any issues with beavers and I'm happy to help walk through ways that we can coexist with beavers on our stream sites. Okay, so we're gonna take another question break. If you have any questions about geomorphology, sediment, stream movement, uh, or beavers, uh, this is your opportunity. Sarah, you're still muted. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we did have a question earlier, right before we ended our first session. Um, someone said, I know there's a fish window, but can you dive deeper or just explain why there's a fish window? Yeah, so the fish window typically has to do with, um, you know, what we can do in streams. The fish window is usually in the summer because that's the time when there's the least potential impact to fish. So if we can imagine fall to winter is really, you know, late fall to early winter is when we're having those adults returning, the spawners returning to lay eggs. So we don't want to be doing any work in streams at that time. And then those eggs are developing through the winter and into early spring. And so once again, we don't want to be doing anything in the stream to disturb those eggs. Um, and so then we've got juveniles living in the stream. Some species of salmon, their juveniles head straight out to the ocean once they hatch. They're only in the freshwater for a short time. Others, like I've mentioned, stay in the stream for a long time. So the summer is when we've got that window of the least potential impact to our salmon species. Um, and so that fish window is set based on the watershed and you know the fish in that watershed and what their, their life cycle is. Is that a good brief description? <laughs> okay. That's great. Um, I don't have any more questions on my end, but Ariana, do you have anything on Facebook? Nothing on Facebook. Perfect. Okay, well then we'll just keep moving so we can slide through the rest of this. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about invasive plants, and I know we already had a question about this. So I'm just going to run through some of the kind of key players, our enemies we're dealing with when we talk about invasive plants. Um, a big one that we have around here is Himalayan blackberry. This is a photo of it kind of just covering a whole area. Um, the main concern with invasive plants is that they can outcompete our native plants and they often are less good habitat for our fish and wildlife, right? If you've got this monoculture of blackberry like this, this isn't doing much to shade our stream. It's not offering much quality of habitat to a lot of species. Certainly there are some species that benefit from plants like blackberry, but in general it leads to lower biodiversity, less species that are utilizing this space um, and kind of contributes to some of those issues that we've talked about with, uh, you know, stream temperatures, not having that shade, things like that. So blackberry is a tough one. Um, it can be controlled manually by digging it out, um, but also herbicide can be used on blackberry in a number of ways. So if you're looking to get rid of blackberry, certainly reach out to us and we're happy to help with some of those methods uh, for getting rid of blackberry. Um, another key player that we deal with around here is reed canary grass. Um, so you'll see this often in our wet areas where maybe historically there was some agriculture, so trees were cleared, reed canary grass moved in, but maybe there's not ag now, or maybe it's not utilized um, in the same way. And so reed canary grass just takes over. It's very tall. Uh, this summer, I swear it was the worst I've ever seen it. And I went to a site and it was like eight feet tall in June, um, already well over my head. Uh, so certainly it gets really tall. That, leaves little opportunity for some of our native plants to establish. Um, and this one's tough, really the, the best way to get rid of reed canary grass, and it's pretty much impossible to fully get rid of it, but the best way is to shade it out by planting plants that are tall enough to keep growing and prevent the reed canary grass from getting any light. Um, English ivy uh, can carpet a whole 
area, but it can also start climbing tall, mature trees. And you'll see these big infestations of ivy where it's climbing up into trees and starting to take them down um, just by the weight and blocking out their sunlight. So ivy is pretty easy to control pulling with your hands. You could pull it out. It does have kind of long roots. Um, you know, it, it vines itself. So you have to get rid of all those vines. Little pieces that are left behind can cause some problems. Um, so I did just embark, I don't live on a stream side, but I did embark on getting all the ivy out of my yard and I'm still working on it and doing spot checks, but um, it only took us a couple days <laughs> to pull it all up and we have piles piled up. So um, ivy is one that, you know, it's a good hard day to pull out all of those vines, but definitely doable. Um, and then knotweed, which was already discussed briefly. Um, knotweed is a tough one. It likes to grow in wet riparian areas along stream sides um, and has these very long fibrous roots that are really hard to track down. So it's not easy to control knotweed by pulling it out of the ground, trying to dig up all those roots. It'll just keep re-sprouting from any little pieces that are left behind. Um, so really the, the only very, uh, you know, the best way to control knotweed is utilizing herbicides. There are several different ways you can do it, um, but there's not a lot of really good options without herbicide use for uh, controlling knotweed in a reasonable way. Um, so knotweed can also contribute to some erosion problems. One of its life cycle uh, things that it does is it uses those roots to kind of get really down into the ground and instead of stabilizing, it really is trying to push off and float itself down the river more. Um, so it's it's pretty wild. Um, you know, most plants are really helping stabilize and knotweeds kind of destabilizing. Um, so that one's tough and they, they get very tall. So once again, blocking out our native plants from growing. Okay, invasive plants. That's a lot, but that was my brief run down, down of some of our key players. There are certainly others. Um, so I want to revisit the benefits of our riparian buffers and of these streamside forests. So if you think about, you know, historically our streams are used to having these forests and um, those benefits that we talked about earlier, shade to keep the stream cool. Um, they help to filter water and pollutants that come into the stream system. So they're helping to keep it clean um, and really holding on to the soil along the stream side to help prevent some of that erosion and sediment input to keep the water clear. So having these buffers, these areas, planted areas adjacent to our streams is really beneficial for all of these fish wildlife concerns that we've been talking about. All of these impacts um, really come back to this loss of our stream side forest. And one of the best ways that we can manage our stream sides is to return a riparian buffer to these streams. We want to keep those streams forested and continue to help, you know, pull in all of these benefits of having a riparian buffer. So this is a quick photos from the, the beginning of just what a healthy stream system might look like. You know, we've got lots of different vegetation, lots of diversity of vegetation, not just one monoculture of blackberry. We've got wood in the stream, um, you know, vegetation all the way up to the stream. It's well shaded, it's cool, the water is clear and clean. So this is kind of that, that ideal picture of what our stream site could look like. Um, and you know, I wanna bring this back to the whole mission of what we're doing here at the Conservation District is really we're trying to restore this habitat. We want this to be the best possible habitat for fish. Um, and we do have defined goals throughout our region, not just at the Conservation District, but with many of our partners, all these folks working towards this common goal of recovering salmon and recovering those salmon populations. So we have high priority areas that we want to target and, and keep these streams healthy by restoring them um, and bringing back these forest functions. Um, so we do have kind of these targeted goals and part of the reason that we have funding to do this work is because of these targeted goals and that we are working in these target watersheds to really bring back fish. Um, so, one thing that our current funding uh, focuses on is big buffers. We want streamside forests that don't just have a row of trees planted. Certainly a row of trees is gonna help, but as Kristen showed, you know, if we do get some stream movement and that one tree falls in, what's behind it? Is it just continued, you know, empty reed canary grass field? 
what can we do to kind of bring this whole ecosystem back instead of just a chute of water moving through our property. Um, so we really want to think about big buffers expanding that streamside forest to really exponentially increase all of these benefits. So everything that we've talked about, shade, complexity, uh, you know, holding onto the soil to prevent erosion, all of that is expanded by having these bigger buffers and gives us that opportunity to connect to the, the stream system's floodplain. If we've got this forest for a long distance from the stream, if it moves, that's great. We've still got forest next to it. It's all working out fine. Um, and so really we want to focus on trying to get these big buffers as big as we can uh, to keep that forest functioning and provide even better habitat. And this is something that we can help with at the Snohomish Conservation District. So, you know, a big piece of what we're doing is we like to provide these outreach talks, but we can also come visit properties and provide technical assistance. Um, and we do have funding to help implement projects like this, especially these really big buffers. So if you've got 100 feet or more adjacent to your stream that you're able to plant, we can help. We can bring in the labor, the trees, we can provide the planting plan, we can do it all um, and really help return these forests and these streams to a healthy condition. So I want to walk through kind of the steps of what that will look like. So certainly, you know, the first step is you call me and I come out and tell you, wow, this is awesome. So glad you're excited to plant trees and um, let's get going. And then once we start getting going, the first step is site prep. So we take that monoculture of blackberry, we get rid of it, um, you know, probably mowing it down, maybe digging out the roots, trying to get rid of that blackberry so we have this great space to plant our trees. Um, and then we'll come in with a suite of native plants and plant everything from conifer trees to deciduous trees like big leaf maples or cottonwoods and all the way down to our little shrubs that will help create this beautiful diverse understory with lots of habitat for wildlife. Um, some plantings will install uh, tubes or protection around the plants um, which is great. So this is kind of an image of like a just completed planting where you can see all of those tubes lined up. Each one is a little small baby tree or shrub ready to grow. And then we'll come back and provide some maintenance. So certainly, you know, especially in these reed canary grass areas or areas with lots of invasive species, um, those trees are going to need a little bit of help to get established. If we've got reed canary grass growing eight feet tall over our small three foot tall Douglas fir tree, how is it ever going to grow to be its big, full 200 foot height? Um, certainly we need to come in and help it get big. So um, we provide maintenance in the form of control of invasive weeds, replanting as necessary, um, which is really special. Um, and then the great part is you get to watch your trees grow. Um, so Sarah and I this summer went out and visited several different sites and happened to see a cedar tree on every single one because they're one that we love to plant, a very long-lived uh, conifer that we have. So these are three different sites in year one of planting, year five of planting, and year 15 of planting. So this is kind of the process of that buffer becoming a forest. It doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. Um, you know, those trees that we plant are small, but they grow and grow and grow. And you can see, even as this changes, you can see where year one, that planting site, I was just standing there and sweating. It was so hot. This was like in July. And then year five, I found some little shady spots among the trees. And year 15, it was cool underneath that forest. Um, and it was really, really special to see that, that change over the years. Um, and certainly something that's really beautiful to see on different properties. Okay, so Kristen's going to jump in here. As I unmute myself. Um, so one question that we get a lot at the conservation district is what am I allowed to do on my stream, river, and wetland? And sometimes you can get the message that, gosh, these are no touch areas and, and um, it can kind of start to feel pretty negative, especially when you bought the property because you wanted to enjoy the stream. Um, you know, it's, I've got a little kid. I love playing in the river with her, um, watching the fish come back, catching the stream bugs. Like, and all of that is stuff that you can still do and um, be a good steward of your property. But it is important to know kind of what you have on your property and what the rules are, um, just so that you can protect yourself. Um, if, if nothing else, um, you definitely want to be able to protect yourself. So um, 
let's see, there are streams are, thank you, Elisa. Yes, yeah, streams are critical areas. Um, they are protected by um, federal all the way down to county um, and city laws. And so in Snohomish County, it's really easy to try to figure out might, what might um, the rules be or what might be the protected area or critical area um, along my stream or river or wetland. Um, I've put up a, a quick screenshot of um, Snohomish County's PDS or Planning and Development Services map portal. And you can go on there and you can actually zoom into your property and see you know, if you've got critical areas. Now these are um, estimates. <laughs> these are not um, perfect map layers. And so it just gives you an idea uh, of what you might have. Next slide. Um, and then that can really start to inform um, the decisions that you make. So this is a, um, a snapshot of what that, uh, what that map portal looks like. And you can see that it has um, the streams mapped out um, and they're highlighted in different colors. Green means it's a fish bearing stream. Blue kind of down the, toward the bottom of the, the lower right corner of your screen shows a non fish bearing stream. Um, the pinkish color is um, a, a statewide or a shoreline which has different rules and then you can see suspected wetlands so these polygons um, that you see in um, kind of peachy are suspected wetlands doesn't mean that a wetland actually actually exists or that the wetland exists exactly where it is um, but it starts to give you an idea of what might exist on your property and then you can start to make decisions about how you manage your property next slide please so that's all publicly available on that website and we can certainly get you get you in touch with that um, if you didn't write down the um, the url it's also really easy to google um, but as i said as i was pointing out all those different streams so the shoreline the fish bearing and the non-fish bearing they have different protected areas or buffers along um, that that feature and so for shorelines um, that protected area is 150 feet now that doesn't mean that if you have a house or a lawn or a pasture or a garden or whatever within that 150 feet that you're in trouble. Um, any existing use is kind of already grandfathered in. It's when you are looking at a property and say you live on the, the North Fork Stillaguamish River, which has a 150 foot critical area or buffer uh, on its critical area. Um, and you wanna put say a new, um, a new garden shed or a new shop in, well, you do need to know, be, put that new area in outside of that critical area, that 150 foot buffer. Um, otherwise you would uh, trigger not just permitting, um, but potentially mitigation. So um, Snohomish County has a watershed steward who can provide a lot of advice about this. Elisa, Sarah, and I um, also can provide advice and help you understand what those protected buffers are and what you're allowed to do and not do. Um, so I just wanted to touch lightly on that. You can go to the next slide. Um, and one, one thing that we get a lot of questions about is NGPAs or CAPAs, um, which are native growth protection areas or critical area protection areas, which is a terrible term. Um, so you may see these signs around uh, that say, you know, this is a protected critical area. Again, these are places where um, we are, where we need to protect that native vegetation and all the stream processes associated with it doesn't mean that you can't walk through it and enjoy it. What it does mean is um, you can't go in and, and build a shop or, um, and ideally, you know, it's pretty low, low intensity recreation. Um, so walking through, not creating big giant gravel paths through those areas. But again, we can answer questions about that on your property. Next slide, please. Um, so as Elisa mentioned, we can, Snohomish Conservation District provides a lot of assistance and it's not just about your stream or river. Um, we can provide free site visits uh, um, to help you with managing your livestock, uh, managing manure on your property. If you have drainage issues, um, uh, Sarah mentioned earlier the rain barrels and, and advice about your stormwater runoff, which can be a really big impact on landslides. Um, so there's just a whole range of services that we can offer. We're actually hiring a forester who can come out and look at your forest. Um, starting early next year. We have um, a lot of resources on our website and uh, snohomoshcd.org and on betterground.org as well. That's more of our regional er, um, advice website. 
we also have fact sheets and um, great stories on our website. We have, we provide a newsletter article, an email newsletter, um, and workshops like this. We can provide advice about invasive, invasive plant control, and I'd love to come back to that question um, again during quick Q&A, but I do want to wrap up so we get to all the questions. Um, and we can connect you with other resources. So there, a lot of times we can't provide advice about landslides, and so what we can do is connect you with geotechnical resources. We can help you figure out where to buy plants if you want to plant your stream um, or river bank. Um, and we do have cost sharing programs, so um, Sally, has taken advantage of one of our cost sharing programs for under our living with beavers program where she was able to get um i think she said pond levelers to help out manage that beaver on the landscape so she still has her beaver but she doesn't have to have um, a completely flooded property um, we can also provide advice or connect you with regulatory entities um, go ahead to the next slide um sorry there's a on our website you can correct uh um, request assistance. So just check out our website if you want to set up a site visit or you can contact Elisa directly. Next slide. And then there are other um, folks who are available to provide advice um, and I wanted to just highlight a few in the still Wamish watershed. Um, Adam Jackson is the watershed steward and, he, steward and he can also provide free site visits. Snohomish County Planning and Development Services is the place you'd go if you have questions about regulator, uh, regulations. And then um, you had the, we had a question about in-water work, and that is actually um, something that Paul Markson from Fish and Wildlife, if you're in the Stillwomish watershed, can answer, or we can connect you with your, your local habitat biologist from Fish and Wildlife. Oh, that was a lot. Um, there's also, we have a resource packet for um, attendees. If you're interested in getting um, a packet of information about critical areas regulations and where to buy plants um, or what cost share programs the Snohomish Conservation District offers, please reach out to Sarah. Um, actually, I think we're going to send that out to all registered attendees, but if you'd like that, you can reach out to us and we can email a packet to you. And Elisa, I'll turn it back to you to close us out. Perfect. Questions? All right, so maybe if it hasn't been clear, if someone does just have a small stream on their property, what's the best thing to do? Is it just like keep native plants? Um, does there like need any more work need to be done? Or is it just like native plants, native plants, native plants? <laughs> yeah, I would say that's the big takeaway message that I wanna give everybody is that planting the stream side is the best thing that you can do with native plants. Um, you know, quick and easy to resolve a lot of these impacts. Uh, yeah, Kristen? Well, and one thing I wanted to add is that um, we do have grant funding right now to plant these wide buffers that Elisa mentioned, these 100 foot plus buffers, but we also can sometimes provide financial assistance or, or work with you to um, plant your buffer even on smaller parcels or places where you don't have 100 feet. Not <laughs> lots of people don't have 100 feet where they can can do that. And even if we can't do the project for you, um, we can help connect you with low cost uh, plants. Um, sometimes we can even donate plants for smaller scale planting projects. So. Um, as Elisa said, um, you may not have 100 feet, you may not even have 50 feet, um, but if you can plant some vegetation, then that will provide some benefit, and we're happy to, to try to help you find, um, find those plants and maybe even donate a few to your cause. Yeah, and I know we've already plugged it a couple times, but as the plant sale manager, I would be remiss not to mention it again, that our plant sale is um, amazing and can offer a lot of, a huge variety of species that are a really low cost. Um, and as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, that sale will, um, our pre-orders will open in January. Um, it's all online sales this year. And then the plant sale pickup will actually be at the end of February. Um, so. If you're looking to get some native plants, certainly reach out and I'm happy to provide some guidance on what we'll be offering and the best way to, to get up on that. Perfect. I, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't see any questions anymore on my side. Ariana, do you have anything on your side? There's nothing more. Um, you already answered all of them, so thank you for that. Wow. 
So I did want to come back to, I think there was a question about pesticide use and, and not weed. So I'm happy to, I don't know. So I can't answer on behalf of the Snohomish Conservation District kind of what our, what our policy is really, um, but we follow best, best practices. Um, so for not weed control, um, the recommended approach is using herbicides responsibly. In a lot of cases for knotweed that requires using aquatic labeled, which means that you, it's a restricted use pesticide. You can't, not just anyone can go buy it. You actually have to um, be allowed to do that through WSDA, you have a license. I think it's called a license. Um, yeah, the applicator's license. Applicate, yeah. So um, because, because you need to be careful <laughs> applying herbicides in that area, um, in that, in your stream, river, or wetland. Um, there are a lot of programs out there that will provide advice. In some cases, um, there are county noxious weed control boards that will loan people injection guns. These are like little, um, almost like, in, yeah, it's basically a syringe, kind of a fancy syringe that um, allows you to inject pesticide or the herbicide directly into the stem. Um, so that's our approach. And when we take on not weed management on private property, we, you know, we work with the property owner to take on, uh, to develop a management plan, and then we execute that, and in most cases, we're using herbicide. Um, in the Stillaguamish Basin, Snohomish County Noxious Weed Control Board has a, I don't know, 10-year-old, maybe more, uh, program controlling, and they're, they're doing it in a very strategic way, working from the top of the watershed down to try to eradicate, um, or not eradicate, Oh, they, they'd shake their hand at me if I said that. Um, but to try to get control of, of the knotweed that um, has invaded the still Wamish watershed. And King County has um, a pretty great and uh, great program as well. I don't know if you have anything to add, Sarah or Lisa. No, that was perfect. I don't know, but yes, King County, just with the funding that they have available to them, um, do sometimes have more robust programs and um, just different resources that are available to you that you can download, which are really great. All right, well, any last questions? Just truly, we appreciate everyone um, joining us tonight for the webinars. We hope in the next year we can do face-to-face events and see each other in person, shake hands again, and be able to just have more personal connection. Um, but we just really appreciate you joining. And so last call. Uh, yeah, just thanks everyone. Um, yeah, Kristen, Elisa, anything to say? No, just thank you so much. Yep, thanks Great. for joining us tonight. All right, well, I'm going to end it here and have a good evening. Stay safe and enjoy the weekend. Bye. Bye, everyone.